Starship Booster 7 is back in heat. Dragon flies to the space station. Starlink gets approved to increase the flock. Another former engineer speaks his mind, and we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. On Monday, SpaceX was back at it with Booster 7, filling her tanks for her next static fire before an orbital flight can be attempted. But it appeared issues may have been encountered and that cars at one point returned to the pad and then ultimately the test was aborted altogether and roads reopened to the public. However, notices went back out to locals the next day for another attempt and this time we saw it do something. Booster 7 completed a long duration static fire test, I counted 13 seconds, of 11 Raptor 2 engines on the orbital launch pad at Starbase, Texas, which is three fewer than the previous light up a couple weeks ago. Like pretty much every other boom practice before it, some engines need to be replaced for whatever reasons. Do keep in mind the Raptor 2 is so brand spanking new, it hasn't even flown yet. Two engines arrived on site to be swapped out the following day, but after the lift went up on Thursday afternoon, it came back down empty. Issues yanking one out, fellas. Been there, but happy to see you got one off this morning. Huzzah. MZ, the man behind the Dear Moon project, the first crewed starship that will orbit our natural satellite, is back on the radar, tweeting next week I will be making a major announcement about space again. Hey, thanks for the heads up, guy. Whatever could it be? On Saturday, Falcon 9 launched the last Dragon mission of the year for NASA, resupply mission 26 to the space station, lifting off from Pad 39A Florida. Check out the boost back burn bra. Again, this was the first mission for the capsule. She is the third and final cargo dragon to be built, rendezvousing and docking successfully with the ISS on the dark side the next morning. Booster was new as well, sticking a landing on Just Read the Instructions, cast away on the Atlantic. SpaceX was also scheduled to launch Japan's first privately led lunar lander to the lunar surface this week, but inspections of the launch vehicle and data it provided led to multiple stand downs. A new date has yet been targeted. But it looks like the coming Tuesday could be quite lively. At the time of this recording, not one, not three, but two Falcon missions are slated for liftoff from Florida's coast. And would you look at that? The payloads are frenemies. <laughs> <laughs> Concerning Starlink news for the week, the FCC announced on Thursday they have given the green light for SpaceX to launch 7,500 of their Gen 2 Starlink satellites into their constellation, currently totaling 3,500 of their versions 1 and 1.5. SpaceX has proposed a network composing of 30,000 satellites. Originally, Elon said Starship would be required to deploy these much larger V2 sats, but the other month he did clarify they could launch far fewer at a time using Falcon. PC Mag has a story covering SpaceX's recent price increase for Starlink service and hardware in Ukraine. The monthly cost for users and country will rise from $60 to $75 at the end of December, with $200 tacked onto terminal fees, according to recent emails sent out by the company to customers. This comes after months of indications that Starlink is struggling with revenue. In October, SpaceX told the DoD they could no longer fund Starlink in Ukraine, but ultimately decided to continue doing so anyway. Oh, and possibly related to the Russian-Ukraine war, but possibly not. Starlink suffered a global outage lasting less than a half hour on Wednesday. Anyway, here's my take on this price increase everyone seems to be bitching about. America is a capitalist society with nonprofits, charities, and churches, etc. to handle humanitarian aid. Of course, companies like SpaceX also tend to set up their own avenues to give back to those in need. And to be clear, all of the above is happening in the Starlink Ukraine situation. But it's important to keep in mind that corporations are first and foremost profit driven. They are a business. Businesses exist to turn profits, not give services away for a loss until they're bankrupt. Elon has been perfectly clear about this since Starlink's inception. Guess how many uh, Leo constellations uh, didn't go bankrupt? Zero. Right. Zero. As the economy spirals, Elon has said that SpaceX is in a good position, but God forbid they do tank, Ukraine won't have service anymore anyway. We all love Starship and want to send lib nerds to Mars. Kidding, but if you're offended because you think I'm joking about you, yeah, you're probably right. But building and blowing up all those vessels so we can get them there requires capital. Starlink was one of multiple revenue streams SpaceX set up to fund Starship. Go to Kickstarter. You know, collecting underpants. Um, these didn't pan out. I don't get it. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. 
So can we at least take a step back and appreciate the complexity of running such a large corporation successfully, in calling? A year ago, I covered a complaint against SpaceX by a number of ex-employees published on Lioness. Well, another complaint from a former principal engineer is making the rounds in the news this week. John Johnson, from what I can deduce, started working at SpaceX as an engineer around 2017, 2018, performing a number of vital tasks across several engineering disciplines like optics and space lasers. In his very first paragraph, John brings up his belief that it is essential a diverse workforce reflects all demographics of American society. And like last year's complaint, immediately the reader gets an eyeful of wokeism, of which I couldn't disagree more. Our military under Biden has declined in manpower and capability in part thanks to wokeism. And as an individualist, I believe merit, or the content of one's character, not the color of one's skin or sex, is the answer. But you know, what does Martin Luther King know? Throw your triggered rage in the comments below, racist. But to his credit, unlike the previous complainants, John quickly moves on. A man in his late 50s at the time of joining SpaceX, John's a hard worker, often spending every day of the week working on site at SpaceX after getting hired by the company, even during COVID while others are working remotely. Even after suffering a back injury in early 2019, he didn't miss work despite weeks of physical therapy appointments. John's managers liked what he brought to the table at SpaceX, so they gave him stellar reviews. But eventually John did need to go in for surgery and miss a few days of work. And it was around this time that new, inexperienced, younger male engineers in their 20s and 30s began taking over John's responsibilities. And John began to feel he was being replaced, his presence at the company no longer valued like it once was. Especially after one of said new employees told John he was to shadow him because John, quote, might retire or die, according to a Starlink manager. He believed this conspiracy to have him outed was being orchestrated by top brass within the company, naming Mark Juncosa specifically, who I believe recently took over operations at Starbase if I'm not mistaken. By this time, John had already gone to HR to report his belief that age discrimination may be afoot, but was told this is all just a big misunderstanding. So eventually John went to the top, Gwen Shotwell, after he read last year's Lioness article mentioned earlier. But by early 2022, he had not heard back from Shotwell. Instead, he was informed by HR that things had changed and SpaceX no longer had work for him in his technology area. But they would try to identify work for him elsewhere. John took this move as an indication the company was pushing him to leave. And so after the new promised work never materialized and managers were questioning his ability to deliver, he left SpaceX in June. SpaceX doesn't tend to comment on matters such as these, so we only have John's side of the story here. And obviously there's going to be bias, but from what he's written, you gotta feel bad for the guy, you know? Being a hardworking Mark and who just wanted to keep working and could have kept working apparently. One thing I will comment on as an outsider looking in, because this is my show, and this goes back to our previous conversation, SpaceX is a profit-driven corporation, as all companies need to be to be successful. But more than that, SpaceX is an innovator in the rocket industry. They are the tip of the spear on a global level. Things move quickly at SpaceX because they have to. So maybe the company has their reasons for doing what they did, not saying it's justified because we just don't know the communication that went on behind the scenes. And John doesn't know either. The whole thing is unfortunate, but I wanna leave my younger viewers with some advice I learned the hard way. And I'm not saying John did this, but after reading what he wrote, it reminded me of something I went through after being injured in the service. And it was the hardest lesson of my life that took over a decade of mental pain to work through because foolishly, I wouldn't talk to anybody about it. Don't wrap your identity around a career. Be more than that. Because once it's gone, you'll be left with no purpose, only questioning who it is you are. Just some Kev Kev advice. Speaking of business, you guys are gonna appreciate this. An Ohio-based shop, represent, called Simply Soundless, sells acoustic paneling that looks awfully familiar, wouldn't you say? In fact, so much like Starship Thermal Tiles, they tell me a few people at SpaceX are customers of theirs, placing several orders over the past couple of years to decorate their offices with their acoustic hex tiles. Reading through their website, the quality seems legit, as does the science. I just got mine in the mail last night, and they're freaking sweet, dude. The quality is amazing. You hear that? Here do I. But I wanted to tell you about them before the holidays in case any of you are in need of a radtastic gift idea. I'm super stoked to have the lawyer wife just, you know, stick them in the corner over there because apparently I can't be trusted to line them up nice and neatly with my shaky Parkinson's hands. Use promo code XCENT, that's X-C-E-N-T, at checkout for 15% off for the holidays. There's a link to the store provided in the description below. They tell me they do ship within the US, as obvious as that may be, but also over the border to Canada, buddy. But now it's time for today's honorable mention, friend.
After its launch to space atop SLS on November 16th, the uncrewed crew capsule, Orion, cruised to the moon until it entered its sphere of influence on November 20th. The following day, Orion lost communication with NASA as it disappeared behind the lesser light to govern the night, where it performed an automatic controlled outbound powered flyby burn. This brought the spacecraft to about 130 clicks, or 80 miles, from the lunar surface. A few days later on the 25th, she lit a second time for a lunar orbit insertion, leading it to break Apollo 13's record for farthest distance from Earth a human-rated craft has ever traveled, if you don't count the lunar module ascent stage for Apollo 10. Then on flight day 13, breaking the record for furthest distance for any spacecraft built for humans at 268,562 miles. After spending the next few days circling the moon, Orion executed a minute and a half burn to depart distant retrograde orbit yesterday, and it began its fall back to our planet. She'll splash down off the Cali coast under Schultz Bra, December 11th. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for checking in. Check out our Locals community if you want to support the show and tune into additional content. You can also follow me on Twitter for a good time. Everyone have a nominal weekend, and until next Friday's episode, Godspeed. Godspeed.